you have your Bibles this morning, I want you to turn to Luke chapter 14. And those of you who know Luke chapter 14 know that this is a very difficult passage. It's interesting as we go through this passage that we see one of the biggest crowds that ever followed Jesus, we see here in this passage. And as these people are following him from place to place, Jesus turns around and tells them this that we'll get into in a second. But I, I want you to just think about that, that this is like the biggest crowd that had ever followed Jesus. And what he says to them is very, kind of makes you scratch your head a little bit. But I want to start this morning by telling, uh, by saying thank you to everybody who served in Vacation Bible School this week. I know it was a long week. Um, we were here sometimes till 9 or 10 at night. Um, but I especially want to thank Tara Jones. Um, that's right, give her a hand. Because hers wasn't just last week. She's been planning it for years. Actually, literally two years she's been planning it. And, uh, and to get all the coordination of all the people to come and decorate and all the people that gave that week to come and decorate the week before and all of that, gosh, we just can't thank you enough. You are awesome. Uh, it's awesome to be part of a church that, that serves like that. And we are so thankful for all the work that went into it. And we see the results. We see the Giazes have been blessed. And we see what God does when God's people come together. So with that said, I want to read from, uh, I want to read from Luke chapter 14. We're continuing our series on discipleship. And I'm going to start in Luke chapter 14. I want to start in verse 12. Uh, that's not on the screen, but uh, I want to read from verse 12 to verse 23 to kind of give you a setting for this passage that we're going to look at, which is 25 to the end of the chapter. But it says, he, he said also to the man who had invited him, when you give a dinner or a banquet, do you not invite your friends or your brothers or your relatives or rich neighbors, lest they also invite you in return and you be repaid? But when you give a feast, invite the poor, the crippled, the lame, and the blind, and you will be blessed, because they cannot repay you for you will be repaid in the resurrection of the just. When one of those who reclined at the table with him heard these sayings, he said to him, Blessed is everyone who will eat bread in the kingdom of God. But he said to him, A man once gave a great banquet and invited many. And at the time for the banquet, he sent out his servants to say to those who had been invited, Come, for everything is now ready. They all began to make excuses. The first said to him, I have bought a field and I must go and see it. Please have me excused. Another said, I have bought five yoke of oxen and I go to examine them. Please have me excused. Another said, I have married a wife and therefore I cannot come. So the servant came and reported these things to his master. Then the master of the house became angry and said to his servants, Go out quickly in the streets and the lanes of the city and bring in the poor and the crippled and the blind and the lame. And the servant said, Sir, what you commanded has already been done and still there is room. And the master said to the servant, Go out to the highways and the hedges and compel people to come in that my house may be filled. For I tell you, None of those men who were invited shall taste my banquet. Let's pray. Father, we thank you so much for your word. God, I thank you for this parable here about, uh, about the rich man and his feast. God, I pray, Lord, that today that you will take your word and uh, illuminate it, Lord, and allow your Holy Spirit to speak to our hearts and show us exactly what you want us to learn. And Father, as we learn this, I pray, God, that we will apply it, Lord, that we will search our own hearts and see, Lord, what excuses we're making for following you. And God, I pray, Lord, that whatever they are, Lord, that we will put you back on the throne where you belong in our hearts. God, submit everything to you. So, Lord, I pray that as we have this uh, message this morning, Lord, that you'll speak to our hearts. God, that you'll be glorified. We ask it all in Jesus' name. Amen. So here in chapter 14, we start with this parable. And in this parable, there's, uh, he's, the master has invited these people. And I want to kind of give you an explanation about what happened in those days. 
In those days, they would have a big feast. Say it was a wedding feast that was planned. And they would plan for more than a year out sometimes so that they could go get everything ready. So that the husband, the man that was going to marry the bride would go out and he could collect everything and get all his money together. Build a house for them to stay in. Have everything ready so everything was done just so. And no one knew when the when it was actually going to happen. They could see it's getting close. I mean, we can see the house being built. We can see the man's gone and he's got a good job and he's got everything in place and everything's ready. But they didn't know because the master of the house, the wife's father, would be the one to make the decision that, okay, now it's time. And many times he would make that decision in the middle of the night. He would get up and he would walk, he'd have all his servants walk out and they would start ringing a bell and they'd start shouting that it's time for the party. It's time for the celebration. And then everyone would come out and it was a long celebration. It was weeks sometimes. But the man had invited all his friends and he invited all his neighbors and he invited all the important people. But when the time came, and his crew went out and they started saying, hey, it's time. The party's here. The day is here. Let's go celebrate. I, I can't go. And look at, look at the excuses that, that they gave. The first excuse, the man bought a field and he needed to go see it. Now, let me ask you something. Do you ever buy property sight unseen? I learned a long time ago, my dad said, you could buy, you could buy oceanfront in Iowa People will tell you anything to sell their property. No one goes and buys a field without seeing it. Why now? Why now that this guy has to go to the, he's got to go check out the field now? Right at the wedding time. He's already bought it. It's too late. He can't do anything about it. The excuse just didn't hold water. The second excuse is, the, is uh, as lame as the first. He says, I bought, a, I bought some cows and I have to go examine them. Again, do you think that you would buy Cows that you didn't examine, I mean, they could be famished, they could be old, they could be worthless. You're going to spend a lot of money to get those cows so that you could... No, it doesn't hold water. The third excuse is that I'm married, I can't come. I've used that excuse before. Can I tell you something? The best thing that you will ever do, that you will ever show your family, dad, mom is to show them that my wife is not first in my life. Jesus is. And I am not first in my wife's life. Jesus is. And I ought not to be first in my kids' lives. Jesus should be. And I'll tell you, when we all are on that same trajectory, we're all walking to the same goal, all of a sudden we all start walking in step. Why? Because we're all seeking Jesus. And as we seek Jesus, my marriage gets so much better because I'm walking toward Jesus, she's walking toward Jesus, and as we get closer to Jesus, we get closer together. And as my children start seeing that dad loves mom regardless of anything, but he loves God more, that he's going to put God as priority in his life, I want to tell you something that changes things. You talk about security in a home. Because my kids know that dad loves mom. They don't believe in divorce. Why? Because the Bible frowns on it. Because God said, I have one man with one woman for one lifetime. That's security in the home. That is knowing that dad loves mom and mom loves dad and they both love Christ and they are going to pursue Christ with everything that they have. This is Jesus first. That's the secret to having a great family. Make sure that they know God first. If I'm pursuing God I, I, and my wife's pursuing God, we'll grow together. So the master says, okay, go out then. If they're not coming... Go out and I want you to go get the crippled and I want you to go get the blind and I want you to go get all the outcasts and bring them. He said, Master, we've already done that and there's still room. Sadly, the phrase, compel everyone to come. It's been taken to extremes in church history. Augustine used this phrase to torture people to come to Christ. That wasn't what Jesus meant. See, coming to Christ is more than just accepting an invitation. All of the friends and family accepted the invitation, but the excuses came when it was time to go to the banquet. 
When they would go to the banquet, once they got all the people into the banquet, the father would close the doors and lock the door and no one else was welcome in. See, the cost of accepting an invitation is to follow, to follow through with it. We're talking about disciple and I want us to look, we're talking about discipleship and I want us to look at what discipleship is and I, I want you to understand that Christ isn't flippant about what we're called to do, who we're called to be. Because we have to read the rest of the story in context with the first part. First thing I want you to see, look at verses 25 and 26. See, a disciple will elevate his faith over his family. Now remember, all these crowds are following Jesus. He's just told them this parable. He says this, now great crowds accompanied him and, they, and he turned and said to them, these huge crowds are coming and they're following after him. Now, wouldn't you think he'd say something like really sweet and really nice and really soft that they would like, yeah, that's so nice. Boy, that gives me warm fuzzies all over. Look what Jesus says. He says, if anyone comes after me and does not hate his own father and mother and wife and children and brothers and sisters, yea, even his own life, he cannot be my disciple. What? I mean, I'm a pastor, but every time I read that, it's shocking. It makes me like cringe, like, God, really? Like, what does that mean? It means that Jesus must come above my personal relationships. When the disciples followed him, what did they do? They left everything and they followed him. See, love and loyalty to Christ is a whole new category. It's a relationship elevated. Now listen to me, no other prophet ever made that claim. Moses didn't make that claim. Elijah or Elisha didn't make that claim. Why? Because they weren't the Son of God. They weren't deity. Only God could make this claim. Only God could make this, make this what it is. And Jesus said, this is elevated. Jesus is God. He has the right to make a demand even as God. It hits us hard. But it seems like it must be written wrong. But what I found is that if, I, if my love for Jesus is first, I will love my wife and my kids and my family more than I ever could without having Christ first in my life. See, it's love that's elevated. I read this quote from Napoleon. I, I don't think I've ever used a quote from Napoleon before, but I thought this is fantastic. Napoleon said this about Jesus. He said, I know men. And I tell you that Jesus Christ was no mere man. Between him and every other person in the world, there is no possible term of comparison. Alexander the Great, Caesar, Charlemagne, and I have founded empires. But on what did we rest the creation of our genius? Upon force. Jesus Christ founded his empire upon love. And this very hour, millions of men would willfully lay down their life for him. So you say, well, how does that fit in here? Because what Jesus demands is he demands that we love God more than everyone else. We've been going through these rules of discipleship. And the first rule of discipleship is that we are called to love God more than everyone else. More than my wife, more than my kids, more than my family. Why? Because when I love, when I love him more than everyone else, then everything else falls in line. All of a sudden, my, wife, my life, my marriage is better. Why? Because I'm loving and serving my wife the way that Christ loved and served the church. That my, that my kids are better because I am disciplining them according to what God said. That I'm doing what God said. And all of a sudden, everything gets better. He didn't say this out of spite. He didn't say this to beat him over the head. He said this out of love. The first thing I want you to see is the disciple elevates his faith over his family. The second thing I want you to see is the disciple elevates sacrifice over self-centeredness. Look at verse 27. It says, whoever does not bear his own cross and come after me cannot be my disciple. I know some of you are sitting here and going, oh, my mother-in-law, that's my cross to bear. 
Oh, my teenage son or daughter, that's my cross to bear. No, it's not. See, carrying your cross is trading in my will for his will. Trading in my will for his will. Have you ever tried to tell God, God, you can have everything, but God, I'll surrender everything, but Lord, don't ask me to do that. Man, I wrestled with that. When God called me in ministry, I remember thinking, God, you're going to send me to some God-forsaken place that I, can't, that I won't be able to take, that I won't be able to stand. I thought he's going to send me to Alaska. I hate the cold weather. I grew up in northwestern Pennsylvania off Lake Erie. It was cold all the time. In the summer, it was cold. But I had to wrestle with that and say, Lord, you can have everything. Then when my kids came along, I was like, all right, Lord, I know how hard it is to serve you. I know how hard it is to follow you, Lord. But God, they're yours too. What I found is the more that I trust God, the more God desires. And it's not a negative thing. It's a positive thing. The more things I want to give them. It's been awesome going through this with Josh and Becky and just str them struggling with, Lord, where do you want me? And then to sell everything that they have and move out to some place that they don't know. It's almost like Abraham. Go to a place that you don't know. Did they wrestle with it? Yes, they wrestled with it. But you know the conclusion they came to? God, you're God, and I'm not. And I surrender all. We don't like that. A.W. Tozer said it like this. He was asked what it means to take up your cross. He said, think about it. A crucified man only faces one direction. You get on a cross... You can't turn around. You can't go anywhere. You're on a cross. You're facing one direction. He said a crucified man is not going back. Look, you get on that cross, it's the end. He said the crucified man has no plans of his own. We see a cross today and it's usually on a gold chain and it's, it's a beautiful piece of jewelry, but the cross was not something beautiful. It was cruel and it was ugly. And its purpose was death. Its purpose was humiliation. Its purpose was to show an example. And they took my Lord and they put Him on a cross and we wear it around our neck like it's some beautiful jewelry. But have we really contemplated what the cross was? That Jesus Christ gave up everything. Gave up heaven, laid aside his deity to come to earth and be born of a virgin and live a, a life not in a palace, live in a, in a, born in a manger. Yet he said, no one took my life, I give it. See, people who were crucified always had to carry their own cross. Remember, Jesus had to carry his own cross until he couldn't anymore. And they put the other man to carry the rest of the way. But a person on a cross always had to carry their cross. What am I dying for? See, when we look at the cross, there's only two things we can do with it. We can flee from it. Or we can die on it. Galatians chapter 2 verse 20 and 21 says, I have been crucified with Christ. It's no longer I who live, but Christ who lives in me. And the life that I now live in the flesh, I live by faith in the Son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. I do not nullify the grace of God, for if righteousness were through the law, then Christ died for no purpose. Listen, we've talked a lot during this series about the series of discipleship, about getting on the altar it's getting on the cross, Lord. I am laying all my stuff aside, Lord. You nailed it to the cross, Lord. I will follow you regardless. If no one else will join me, God, I will follow you. 
Because Jesus died in my place. We're not Muslims. We don't ask people to go die for their cause. We ask people to live for Christ. My old man was crucified on the cross. But he still rears his ugly head. And I still believe the lie sometimes. I still reject getting on that cross. I'm still hanging on to those things. Dietrich Bonhoeffer said this. I've been reading Dietrich Bonhoeffer, and he said this. You are disobedient. You are trying to keep some part of your life under your own control. That is what's preventing you from listening to Christ and believing in his grace. You cannot hear Christ because you are willfully disobedient. Somewhere in your heart, You are refusing to listen to his call. Your difficulty is your sin. Listen, there's been times in my life where I've run from God. I knew in my heart and I knew in my head what I needed to do. But still, I said, I'm not willing, God. There were things that I was hanging on to that I was not willing to surrender. Anybody relate to that? Maybe there's some things you're not willing to surrender right now, and you know exactly what it is. It's not my job to tell you what that is. Your job is to be sensitive to the Holy Spirit leading in your life and say, Lord, I surrender all. Are there areas of your life that you're hanging on to? Is there an area of your life where you refuse to surrender it to Him? See, that's the area that He wants. That's the place in your heart that he's after. Because you know what happens when we do that? We allow a foothold in our life. We say, God, all of it's yours except this one little foothold. We allow that foothold to come in. And then all of a sudden we say, God, you, you can't touch that. And all of a sudden that foothold expands. And all of a sudden it's now a stronghold. It's a fortress that's working through every part of my life. And every part of my life is being affected because of that one thing that I won't say. God, it's yours. That's the area that God wants. Third thing I want you to see is that a disciple evaluates the cost. It says, Luke 14, 28 to 33 says this, For which of you, desiring to build a tower, does not first sit down and count the cost, whether he has enough to complete it? Otherwise, when he's laid the foundation and he's not able to finish it, all who see it will begin to mock him, saying, this man began to build and was not able to finish. Or what king going out to encounter another king in war will not sit down and first deliberate whether he is able to, with 10,000 to meet him who, who comes against him with 20,000? And if not, while the other is yet a great way off, He sends a delegation to ask for terms of peace. So therefore, any one of you who does not renounce all that he has cannot be my disciple. Discipleship is not some easy choice. It, It ought to be something that you wrestle with. Lord, I want to be your disciple. And so, Lord, I surrender all to you. He gives two examples. The first example is a tower. In that day, they would build a tower in the middle of the field that, that they could, so they could house people and they could do all the work and stuff in that tower. But who would build a tower and not count the cost? My wife works for a builder, and, and they always do these plans, and the, and the people agree to the plans. They start building, and then they say, oh, but I want to change this, and oh, I want to change this. And they go, yeah, but that's going to cost more. This is what your budget said. No, it, th- we're going to change this. We're going to change this. Why? Because houses are just like wars. They always go up. It always costs more than what you anticipated. But you've got to sit down and count the cost and see, am I able to do it? There's a house, uh, um, it's really a mansion that I drive by every once in a while. It's not too far from here, maybe a couple miles from here. And I drive by and they've got this big gates that go all in front of it. And it's this big mansion, but it's been sitting there empty for about five or six years. 
And every time I drive by it, I think, man, they had to spend a million dollars to get where it is there. Why is it just sitting? And I don't know whose house it is. I don't know what the circumstances are. But I, I just kept thinking about that when I was reading this, that how many, how many of us would build a house and not count the cost? The second example is war. How many are going to go to war if you know I'm going to lose? If I go to war, I'm going to lose. I'm not going to lose. But if I look and they've got 100,000 troops coming at me and I got 50,000 troops and I send my guy out there and say, hey, we want to make a peace agreement because you're going to whoop my tail and we're going to end up with nothing. See, with both buildings and war, you have to be all in. You can't stop the house halfway through and just let it sit. You can't go to war and just stop. And I, this is what I want you to see is, as a disciple of Christ, you've got to go all in. I, there's a song I love. It's, I it's, um, uh, can't remember the guy's name, but it says, I'm diving in. I'm going deep. And over my head is where I want to be. Caught in the rush, lost in the flow. In over my head is where I want to go. The river's deep. The river's wide. The river's water's on my side. But here I go. I'm diving in. Sink or swim. I'm all in. Do you know that that is exactly what Christ wants from us? Not what he wants. It's what he requires from us. Is I want you all in. Because I love you. Because I've got plans for you. Because I've got the best life you could ever hope to imagine. But you've got to go all in. Sometimes we're hanging onto the boat going, hanging onto the diving board going, I can't go. I remember taking the kids when they were little to, to the, and seeing these kids that would go on the diving board. They'd, be, they'd walk to the edge and they'd be, oh, oh. And then mom or somebody would get in the water and they're like, jump. And they're like, no way, I ain't jumping. I don't trust you. But that's what it is. We have God who has everything, who wants to bless you, give you exceedingly, abundantly more than you can ask or think. And he's saying, come on, dive in. Go ahead first because here we go. I got, I got a life for you that's so good and so perfect and all you've got to do is trust me. And I'm standing on the edge of the diving board going, God, I don't trust you. God, no, I can't do it. You understand that that's who God is. That's the God that we serve. And what a testimony of Josh and Becky and their family being willing to say, hey, I'm all in. They got this night board, they went, boing, and dove right in. What a testimony of what we're called to do. I don't... God's not calling everyone in here to ministry. God's not calling everyone in here to go to something else. But God is calling for everyone to be all in. Well, we trust them. You can't wage a successful warfare and not be all in. And you can't be a part-time disciple and not be all in. Bonhoeffer said this later on in his book. He said, and if we answer the call to discipleship, where will it lead us? What decisions and partings will it demand? To answer this question, we shall have to go to him. For only he knows the answer. Only Jesus Christ who bids us to follow him knows the journey's end. But we do not know that it will be a road of boundless mercy. Discipleship means joy. If you don't know who Dietrich Bonhoeffer was, Dietrich Bonhoeffer was a Christian in Nazi Germany. He was sent to prison multiple times and finally he was executed at, I think he was 41 years old. His writings got out because he loved the guards that were, in the, that were guarding him in the prison. They ended up putting him in, in, the, in the enemy camps. But the guards loved him so much because he spoke of Jesus so highly that they would carry out papers that he would write. And they were put together. So we have his writings. 
He understood what counting the cost was. He understood that you got to be all in. But some of us are hanging on. My last point is this. Discipleship, or a disciple emulates the nature of the teacher. Verse 34 and 35, it says, Salt is good, but if salt has lost its taste, how shall, it, how shall its saltiness be restored? It is of no use either for the soil or for the manure pile. It is thrown away. He who has ears, let him hear. Salt that loses its saltiness is no good. You can't, you can't cure any meat with it. You can't do anything with it. They, they used to take it when it was lost a little bit. They'd mix it with the dung and use it as fertilizer. But when salt loses its saltiness, it's of no use. Back then it was a valuable commodity, but if it's not being used as salt, if it's not taking on the characteristic that salt has, then it's worthless. They just throw it away. See, salt is only useful when it has the nature of salt. And church, listen to me. A Christian is only useful when he has the nature of Christ. Do you have the nature of Christ? I mean, think about it. Christ laid down his life. He offered everything for us. We have this easy believism today, and it's scary. That you can be saved by just, just say a prayer. You say this prayer, abracadabra, poof, you're saved. Everything's good now. Go back to living like you want. Um, let me tell you something. That is a lie from the pit of hell. Where there is no repentance, there is no salvation. Repent means that I was walking this way. I was going after the things that I wanted. And Christ saved me and turned me. And I'm going that way. He says, broad is the gate that leads to destruction, but narrow is the way to my kingdom. Narrows the path to righteousness. As a disciple, are you following the wide gate or are you following the narrow path? The one that very few trod down. The one that, that will get us to where we want to go. The one that aligns us with Christ. Is it easy? No. Is it required? Yes. Listen, I don't know where you are this morning. Maybe you've been wrestling with God. Maybe there's some things, maybe you're a Christian and you know that God's calling you to, to give these things over to him. But you're struggling and you're saying, but God, I've got so many things I want to do. I've got so many. Listen to me. Either he's God or he's not. He's either Lord of all or not Lord at all. God doesn't come first, then you need to adjust your priorities. Matthew 6, seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness. And then what's he say? And all these things will be added unto you. There's a song they're going to sing in just a moment as we have this invitation. But I, I want to read the lyrics to you. The song is crucified with Christ. It says, as I look back on what I thought was living, I'm amazed at the price I chose to pay. And to think I ignored what really mattered because I thought the sacrifice would be too great. But when I finally reached the point of giving in, I found the cross was calling even then. And even though it took dying to survive, I never felt so much alive. For I am crucified with Christ, and yet I live. Not I, but Christ lives in me. 
For his cross will never ask for more than I can give. Because it's not my strength, but his. There's no greater sacrifice. For I am crucified with Christ. As I hear the Savior call for daily dying, I will bow beneath the weight of Calvary. Let my hands surrender to his piercing purpose that holds me to the cross but sets me free. I will glory in the power of the cross. The things I thought were gain, I count as loss. And with his suffering, I identify. And by his resurrection power, I am alive. For I am crucified with Christ. And yet I live. Wonder this morning. Are you here this morning and God is dealing with you about surrendering somewhere in your life? I don't know where you're at. Some of you I don't know. Some of you I know very well. But I don't know what God's dealing with you about. But this is what his word says. This is the demand of the invitation. Remember we started with the invitation of the rich man. And he invited people to come. When it came time to it they said nah. I got better things to do. And then Jesus goes into this truth. The cost of being a disciple. And maybe you haven't counted the cost. Maybe you haven't surrendered to his will. Listen, maybe you're here and you're not even saved. Listen, I want to tell you something. Christ died for you. But he didn't stay dead. He rose again. So that I can be free. But I must surrender to his will, to his purpose. I'm going to ask you to bow your heads and close your eyes. Look, I know this is not some, this is not some fun message that we get to come and celebrate. This is, but it's serious. What scares me to death is there are so many churches and so many people that are just this easy believism that you just say this prayer and abracadabra, you're saved. You go back to living however you want. But God called us to be crucified with Christ. And live the life that he has for me. Maybe you're here this morning, you're a Christian, you say, Pastor, God is dealing with me. I know exactly what he wants me to surrender. I know what I'm hanging on to. And God, I need to surrender it. I need to let it go. Can you pray for me? If that's your prayer this morning, would you slip up your hand so I can pray for you? Amen. Amen. How about you? Maybe you're here today and you're not a Christian. Maybe this is the first time you ever heard anything like this. I want to implore you to count the cost. But I'm telling you, when you count the cost, when I realize what Christ did for me, when I realize what he has to offer me, I would do it every time. Maybe you're here this morning and God's dealing with you and you say, Pastor, can you pray for me? I'm not saved. I'm not a Christian. I've never trusted Christ with my life. And I know God's dealing with me about it and today is the day. I surrender all. If that's you this morning, you say, Pastor, can you pray for me? That God is dealing with me right now. If that's your prayer, would you slip up your hand so I can pray for you? just a moment we're going to have an invitation I'm going to ask you to stand for prayer and we're going to have an invitation if you need to come this morning I pray that you'll come I pray that you won't come alone I pray that somebody will come and pray with you because together we can do much more for Christ let's stand for prayer Father we love you Lord I'm so thankful God that you love me that you love me so much that you sent your one and only son to die in my place to reconcile me back to you God, I'm sorry for the times, Lord, where I've taken my life back and decided I want what I want and not what you want. Lord, but it's a daily struggle. God, I pray, Lord, if you're dealing with hearts this morning, Lord, that you will deal with them, Lord, and they will get it right with you. God, if there's one not saved today, Lord, I pray that you'll convict them, Lord, that you will allow your Holy Spirit to convict them until they can't do anything except surrender. Lord, have your will and your way on this invitation. 
ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. When I look